to our SSO 102 talking about reciprocal switch. What? Reciprocal switch. Reciprocal switch. There's nothing wrong with the air here. There's nothing wrong with the air around here. <gasps> so, uh, thank God for that. But we, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at home in YouTube land, of course, we are abiding by California CDC recommendations here in our own home. We hope that you are safe, comfortable, and happy in yours. So, Dana, it's been a, a fascinating idea to think about, uh, about reciprocal space. It is very much in contrast to the idea of the kind of infinite linear space, which our culture is very, very used to, which uh, was expressed instinctively at the, in art at the time of the cathedrals, also in the perspective of Brutaleschi, and which was uh, codified and made mathematically precise when René Descartes came up with coordinates. And it's really pervasive, this, this way of understanding space. Other cultures and other parts of history have had very different ways of understanding space, and I think that, that the way that you're describing the uh, project that you mentioned last time, the studio um, conceptual project, displayed what is part of a transformation of not just you, but many people understanding space differently because things are changing significantly enough that it's very exciting when the idea of space changes. How do you think, what would you say about the nature of space uh, changing and being, how, how do you think that this idea of reciprocal space is, is either the same or different or both from what we've been used to these, these thousand years? Well, what's really interesting is that our concept of space really relates to religion and how religion had formed and started. And our conception of space really started with the consciousness. And our consciousness is when we had a vision of a higher power that sort of uh, evolved and with that evolution came religion because of that wondering of how far space goes and where uh, where the limits are and and who controls that exactly so in the western european sense the idea of there's the idea of the unmoved mover in the western conception of space that we have become accustomed to there's the sense of God being the unmoved mover, uh, and even in the deist, the secular, close to secular deist tradition of the post-enlightenment philosophy, the idea that the world is created and set going, and you have cause and effect streaming out uh, linearly in time. Of course, the time dimension is brought into this as well. And I think one of the, some of the cracks around the edges in the early 20th century with the idea of when relativity came up is that gravity began to cast doubt on the completeness of the Newtonian model of, of, and which fit within the older idea of space, calculus especially. And so the, the these new observances about space being curved instead of simply continuing out. Uh, for example, uh, it, it, it would be it would be difficult to uh, to understand how light bends around something and how you have time dilation in the old model. So in this in this new model, what would you think is different? about the conception of the divine and, and of confronting the idea of the beyond? Well, I think that with, just like we were saying with that evolution, now that there's sort of this secular, um, the secular uh, revolution that's happening, which, which again, it circles around, it, it happens uh, every, every once in a while, you'll have 
religions breaking down at the core and becoming its own new religion and therefore its own new way of looking at the stars and looking at the cosmos and looking at the miraculous and um, sort of contemplating what that means and now that we have so much technology and science like uh, you know quantum physics quantum mechanics now you have this whole new idea of uh, of space and not of sp just space but how space and time relate and how they weave together in within not only the cosmos but weave within together our lives and our um, metaphysical space Right, and so something that we've, people who are aware of it and curious about it have become, you know, since, you know, 1925 when Einstein got famous for it uh, around then, the idea of time being a dimension of the three dimensions of space because they, time and space are variables that affect each other, um, having to do with the speed of light and... Uh, moving around the edge of the sun, displacing the stars on the eclipse, and so forth. So, do you think that the... do you think that there there is a sense of how we relate to time as being important to this as well? That that t time and space being, being linked? <clears throat> which, yes. which I think is new, really. Yes. I, I think there's a new way of looking at it right, right. now, whereas, as you mentioned, uh, a circular notion and a circular motion of, of uh, linear mathematics, I think that time is also, maybe, there could be a possibility, maybe time also is not just linear, but maybe time itself is circular, and that amount of time is justifiable with a radius and that radius is possibly the essence of time itself maybe maybe the radius is what is time and space woven oh that's amazing here here we're getting into the plot of the movie pi right <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yeah. like we, uh, we could number this 42 here life the universe and everything no but the <clears throat> the whole idea of, of the circle that um, the many ancient cultures uh, incorporated cycles um, and, and they all portray cycles differently and in their own way and the the Western tradition had its own sense of, of cycle so do you think that the uh, the sense of how do you think the sense of cycle has changed the sense of cycle in terms of what? Of time. How the cycle of time has changed. The, the, the perception of the cycle of time. The perception, well, going from linear to circular is mm -hmm. one perception. I think another perception is an overlap where uh, we usually see within, again, religion that time stops and then is reborn mm. and then in other mm. religion time just keeps going and your sense of time just um is not reborn but is still lingering okay and this is the this is fantastic stuff just for people listening at home what would you think would be an example of i can give a few of them what would you think would be an example of uh, a religious or a philosophical tradition where time is stopping and being reborn uh, a philosophical religion that relates to time stopping and being reborn is the sense of um, going to heaven mm -hmm. where this dimension has totally stopped. Your new space is in an entirely different place where your conception is in a new dimension where you, you either have done good in your life or you have done bad that is an entirely different space or a concept and that's uh, i was i was going to add to that that fits in very neatly it's interesting that you bring that up because the cartesian idea of the separation between race extensa and the race cogitans ends up being very uh 
it ends up being a very relevant thing there because it doesn't it's not coming out of nowhere uh that you have a stop of time at death and then a start of time at at the ascension which is a recapitulation of the jesus story mm. where even you even have a new year one okay that the the, the most ancient religions that would be a, a blasphemous thing to have a new year one but then you have those newer religions that that all had a new year one and then they had an apocalyptic tradition where there would be a, a revelation there there would be a new a new start to the world often portrayed as a new kingdom uh, and then they interpret it in any different ways you like so so yeah so there's the stopping and the starting of time and then there's the sense of continuity Mm -hmm. Right, which is the the old, perhaps the old Hindu idea, or the, well, yeah. well, the Hindu idea is very deeply cyclical. The mm -hmm. Egyptian idea is very much about steady, steady, steady continuity. Uh, right. So keep keep going with this. What what were you thinking about the uh, about the current conception as compared to the stopping and starting? Do you um, think it's, it's being different? Yes, I think that the current notion that what I'm sensing right now, that the current notion is a sort of stopping of time. That the current notion is not restarting of time and not overlapping starting of time or overlapping continuation of time, but a stopping of time where people's conception is that science is, uh, is not infinite and mathematics is not infinite, that there is, and that space, I, I'm not sure what the, the majority of people's concept of space would be, but um, in terms of religion and in terms of outer thinking, many people have, in, in the, I'd say the baby boomer generation, people are very much turned towards a stopping cold turkey of time that once they pass life on just life itself ends for them and that they they don't believe themselves in in a another place or in reincarnation so they don't believe in that new starting of time nor the blending of time as morphing and changing, excuse me. Um, at the same time, there's this, there's this um, flip side of the coin where people are becoming incredibly spiritual and you're having this whole new, uh, this, this whole new outlook on Hinduism and that that continuation, that sort of morphing and blending is the other flip side of the coin. So you either have the hands down, no, no religion, you know, I, I very secular, totally atheist, or you have the incredibly uh, spiritual people who truly not just believe, but follow out of instinct and follow out yeah. of I, I think that it's instinctual what do you think I, I think it is completely instinctual and right now it, and it would have to be instinctual because there's a connection in the behavior between these two camps I think that you're correct that in many ways there is a, a, a parting of the ways happening that there is a the, the, there's a splitting in culture uh, there's there's a wider split between first world and third world. I know some people don't like those labels, but please tell me of any better ones. Comment descriptions below. By the way, like, subscribe. Thank you. So that the uh, uh, if you dislike us, show all your friends how articulate you are at criticizing us and put us on Twitter. Yes. So, anyways, the. Um, splitting between first world conditions and third world conditions often in the same country um, often in the same city and you're seeing that in several countries in the world and then you're seeing a split and you have been seeing a split for, for decades between um, this kind of secularization on the one hand and then the instinctual spiritualization on the other hand and, and where those two come together 
where those two come together is that they are both making this decision for the same reason. The people who are going full secular and the people who are going full instinctual are doing it because the world has changed significantly enough that the older structures which were adapted to a way that the world, and specifically human culture, in it was, uh, it, it's no longer connecting. Hmm. It's no longer being as effective, as relevant, as accurately descriptive, as meaningful to people as it had been in the past. And so a bunch of people are saying, it is all meaningless, time stops when you die, for con consciousness stops when you die. Uh, and then some people are saying, no, it, it is all eternal, and you know what, it's this religious tradition, it's this philosophy that is temporary. Hmm. And I have to reconnect to something else, and that's why you have this sense of uh, exoticism. Um, you have this anxiety about cultural appropriation because people are looking everywhere they can for something that makes sense. Yeah. And what instinct there is has not yet found its natural expression. Uh, typically it finds it, one of the reasons I think that architecture fascinates us both, one of the many reasons architecture fascinates us both right now, is that architecture is often one of the earliest expressions of how a new instinct does come out. Because people, it's one of the slowest art, you know, painting changes very quickly. Painting is really sensitive to change, so is music. Painting, I think, even more so. Architecture is slower to be pushed around so much because it has to deal with practicalities. It's not actually an art. It's a craft. It's another discussion. But it, it, it's responsive to these things like the size of our feet and the lengths of our legs that stay the same over thousands of years, roughly. Um, and the idea that we like to sleep when and where it's dark. That, that stays the same. We like to be warm where we live, but not too warm. And all, like, all of these things are consistencies, which means that it does not change with the rapidity. However much certain fancy people might like architecture to be all changing and hyper-innovation like art, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, because it is sensitive to the way that people are understanding the space around them, the way that they want things, the way that they need things to be, when and how architecture changes or needs to change, which is, I think, something that you and I are interested in discovering, and I do consider it discovery, not invention, that this, this might be a locus of the expression of any new instinct as it goes from pure instinct, which I think in kind of these, these new religious feelings that are surfacing, that it's been instinctual since at least the 50s, um, anything that gets called New Age is part of this instinctual category, and moving into more of a regular, pardon the pun for mathematicians out there, into a regular expression. So what, what do you think about, um, about that in terms of, it, uh, of, finding, of finding a balance? And um, how, how do you, first of all, let's look at this instinct. How do you see this instinct? Is it, is it something, I felt it myself, but I found it, I found it difficult to describe, as anyone would. Have you felt it yourself? Have you observed it? How would you describe this, this instinctual perception of connection to a, a vitalized uh, spiritual sense? Um, I, myself, would feel as though it's an instinct in the fact that naturally I have hope and naturally I look up at the sky and I want good things. And because I want good things and I, um, I feel love and people who feel love will instinctually, I believe that all creatures that, that uh, have a certain conception of I, it would be interesting to, to think about the fact that all things living have a, a sort of spiritual idea, whether that idea is fuzzy or vague, or that idea is very blunt. Mm. It, it all has to do with desire and what you want in this life. And... Um, and say, you know, the birds might have who, you know, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about this, the 
birds might have a truly spiritual religious connection that we don't understand because we can't hear maybe they all call to each other and then call to their god that is the sun we don't know and i believe that it is within just nature itself that the idea of religion persists and the idea of religion can is is deeply embedded and the only reason that humans have been able to express that is with our hands and our ability to create and our ability to express and our ability yes our ability to speak and our ability to to to, to reason and examine yeah. and to have to have an observational distance well i think it's, it's so many interesting things here that you bring up in terms of uh there's um one of one of randall carlson's uh, favorite references to make is to is of the the alchemical um, old wisdom tradition speaking of the language of the birds mm. and coincidentally or not there was this is I, I this is something I wrote about years ago in my academic mm. work in my academic studies that the mantras the Brahmin mantras which are part of the oldest Continuous, I believe it is. I mean, uh, the oldest continuous religious tradition in the world. Uh, I think the sand paintings in Australia might have that beat in terms of oldness, but it's hard to say. But it's it's, it's up there. You know, it's probably around forty or fifty thousand years, maybe twenty five thousand. Very very old, uh, and. Uh, Maybe not that old, but still. And they wanted to figure out what it meant. What it actually... How, does this linguistically relate to anything? And I believe that the, tra tra the traditions hold that these are pure sounds, that they don't have a translation attached to them. And so there was linguistic analysis done by some Dutch scientist recording them. He was finally given permission to actually record these things, which was extraordinary. And when he analyzed it, it they found that it was not connected to any human language. The mantras of the Brahmins in India most closely resembled the rhythm, pattern, cadence, and tonality of migratory bird song. Hmm. So we, we don't know. It is so deep in time. We don't know what that connection was. But this language of the birds, as they say, is, is something very, very deep in human philosophy, in human religion, in human metaphysics, to a certain extent in human science. The, the Greeks the, the Greeks and the Romans would observe the paths. There, there, there would be someone who, whose entire job it would be to watch how the birds would move. And then it would tell you things. There, there, are, there are people who live in Greece and Italy today who can tell you what the weather is going to be like because they've been watching the seagulls. Wow. Um, so there's, there, there, there's something to it. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to me that you have this idea of of a religious feeling, of an awareness or a sense of connection being broader than just human consciousness. And I think there is something to that. Um, in the Egyptian traditions, uh, I think it would make sense, uh, far be it for me to say what makes sense to an ancient Egyptian, but uh, I think from what I know of the Egyptian tradition, it would make sense that the uh, they considered that cats were would honor the sun when they where they where they flop over and lay down, and then when they look up and they say, "Rah," <laughs> they feel like they're they're saying the name of Ray, right? They say Amun Ra, Amun Ra, uh, you know, if, if if a cat meows like that, or the um, the birds. Uh, there's the tradition of the Ben Ben bird. What originally the Greeks what a afterwards the Greeks called the phoenix. That when the first light of the sun struck the first rock of Zeptepi, which the pyramids were modeled after, rising out of the turbulent waters, that there was this cry of a bird that was sparked by the light of the sun, as the, the, the birds responding. And, and when you pay attention to how birds do honor sunrise and sunset, lions, the Egyptians mentioned about how lions will roar at the sunset, mm. baboons will chatter at the sunset and the sunrise, and these were considered to be sacred observances by the Egyptians. The, um, when the god Thoth, the god of wisdom and writing, when he is in the world of daytime, he is portrayed as an ibis, because the ibis walks along 
the ibis has the qualities of writing, walking along the sand and poking with a beak and leaving a trail behind, right? Leaving the marks. And so that, for writing, that makes sense. And that's why they chose that symbol. Um, Thoth in the underworld, Thoth in the realm of Osiris, rather than the realm of Horus, Thoth in the underworld is a baboon. And um, I'm not really sure all the esoteric, I haven't become familiar with uh, Egyptian metaphysics to know exactly how those references make sense. I'm sure they do on some level. It's all, all of it is poetic reference. But uh, part of it is that the, uh, uh, the baboons would chatter at the sun, mm -hmm. at both sunrise and sunset. So I think there's, I think there's very much something to the idea. We, we shouldn't limit ourselves to assuming that spirituality is, is simply in the domain of, of uh, human reasoning. Yes, also to assume that uh, atheism or the belief in no religion, I believe that the idea of no religion, yes, it is on the other side of the spectrum at the same time is still a con it, it is still a religious conception. Uh, yes. So therefore, it is, it is still a belief. It is still a religion in a sense. Atheism is a statement of faith. Yeah. To have no faith is to be agnostic by the definitions of it. If you because because God is beyond proof either way, right? Yeah. And yes. And um, so in terms of reciprocal space, mm. it's almost as if the, the two sides, that at some point, religions and uh, atheism and the idea of no religion, and uh, same thing with politics, the idea of uh, no government or some government, everything some uh, after so long, tends to pull itself together and then at the same time it tends to push itself not just push and pull but it tends to push itself the other way and then you have that reciprocal space happening with the idea of religion versus no religion where now the people who have had so many thousands of years of religion who say you know, I, I just, I am what I am, and they sort of become agnostic. They're the people who say that they really don't know at the same time as the people who very are sure either in or the not. Well, yeah, that's, was, that's very interesting. You're mentioning the sense of not just reciprocation, you're describing not just reciprocation, but bifurcation. The idea that you have, and that's, that's, bifurcation is probably a very important part of reciprocation, uh, you know, philosophically and rationally, is that you'll have a, a unification and a separation, and a unification and a separation. And this is something that I think this, I think this definitely shows the influence of, uh, of Taoism upon the Western mind, that people are, are understanding this, is that you have, well, you have what Alan Watts would call the game of black and white, is that you see everything as um, as on, off, back and forth, as this dialogue of opposites. And so you'll see, in, in anyone who takes time to look at history, you'll, you'll see periods of, uh, of consolidation and of separation, and then consolidation again and separation again. Hmm. So, and then you, go ahead. How, how do you see it? Do you see it as a sort of consolidation and then separation? Or do you see it as a consolidation and then a pass? <laughs> that's, that, that's a really fascinating, um, a, a really fascinating way to describe it. Is that they they pass each other, they they pass each other because that's too because either either could happen if you, if you're thinking about things dialectically, which you know thesis, antithesis, synthesis. They come to you have two opposites who come together, they create something new and then there's a further development. And they could come in terms of that further development could be, as you said, the continuation, the continue unified, or it could be that the they could bounce off each other and move away again, or they could switch places. 
you do see that politically. You see the switching places happening at rather weirdly regular intervals with the left and the right and the two parties in the United States. That every once at points of difficulty in American history, at points of great challenge, significant challenge in American history, you see the parties flip. Yeah. And what? Uh, not once or twice. Like once. Once you saw pretty much the creation of a whole new party, and the crisis that for uh, the crisis that foretold that, uh, the crisis that that foretold was this, was the Civil War, uh, where where a party went out of existence and a new party came into place. They were trying to solve this deep problem of uh, you know westward expansion and slavery. They weren't able to do it politically. They tried. They even dismantled one of the political parties, the Whigs, put the Republicans in their place. Uh, or actually the Whigs split into the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, and then several times even after that, you had the parties, basically the, there were two, two parties in power, and then which party was left-wing, which party was right-wing, has flipped several times. Yeah. And I, th I, think, I think the sense, I think that both can happen. You can have a continuity and a synthesis. You can have a bouncing off each other, and you can have a switching places. Do you see, what examples, what examples of each would you find most relevant to our current moment or to where we're heading? Uh, okay, so which, which of the different examples, I would say, I, I, I can't decide because time not only changes, but time relapses. So if it were to bounce, then you would assume that these cultures and this whole idea of reciprocal space then uh, curves around and eventually will curve again and bounce. Because if it's curving okay. out, it will have to come back around, meaning that both of right. them are going to be in two circles that bounce around at different extremes. So then you have to think about it as in, in three dimensions, not just a bouncing of space, yeah. but in a bouncing Right. of space. The two spheres on the Newton's cradle will keep smacking each other around. Yeah, like a pendulum. But you see it in a loop, right? You're, you're, you're envisioning it as, uh, as a, a figure eight, right? Um, not that makes sense. Not quite a figure eight. No? That's the next one, oh. is that then you have this idea of figure eight crisscrossing. Okay. And that By is... the way, that's how stars orbit each other. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, so in this way, where things are crisscrossing each other, mm -hmm. rather than bouncing as such, um, the reason that I think that a crisscrossing is much more relevant is because things never truly, because of the mutation of, of time and the mutation of cultures and the mutation of the way that we look at things, um, it everything does tend to be a whole new way and things tend to blend and things tend to change but do they change enough to be significant enough for that change in a bounce they do i think that one way that they do change is not within the metaphysical but within the physical because I believe mm -hmm. that evolution and mutation is what is happening. It's starting in our current generation where yes. where we are done being, it, a lot of people are done being human. We want to be something else. We want to expand. And that is the physical level where maybe the physical does a, a figure eight of change and the metaphysical does a little loop. And endlich damit ein Schluss <laughs> Ein Schluss zu haben, Mensch zu sein, vorwärts, uh, man, man darf vielleicht Übermensch finden. <laughs> this is the, it's getting Nietzsche in here. So, in, in, you know, in, instead of being, uh, having, being fed up and having an end with, uh, with, being, with being menschlich, you can be übermenschlich. You can, you, instead of being human, you can go to beyond the understanding of human. That was that was Nietzsche's whole idea in in that one book in Zarathustra. Uh, so well, that, this is well, this is something that a lot of people, uh, including David Bowie, have, <laughs> have written about uh, about about reformulating 
reformulating what it is to be human. And I thought it was very interesting that, that you brought it down to the physical realm, out of the metaphysical, into the physical realm. Uh, and Well, and by the way, the, the Brothers of the Serpent podcast, their latest stuff has been talking about very fascinating. Uh, by the way, link in the description. Um, they're great. Uh, the their latest episodes have been about uh, hybridization. That now someone sent them a very interesting uh, email about evolution and thinking, why are you guys beating up on evolution? And they had to say, hey, we're criticizing it scientifically because we think it's an incomplete description, which is a good thing to do. That's what Einstein did to Newton. All right, that's how you have progress as you start asking these questions. And they found a website kind of an answer to this, they found a website of a biologist, fantastic biologist, who talked about, okay, how does hybridization start to answer the questions and solve the gaps that Darwinian evolution has, has been having trouble describing? So it's, it's very, very fascinating here. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of human hybridization, it makes you think, and you, we know that human hybridization happened because anyone who's not an African uh, who's not 100% African, uh, is going to have some uh, Neanderthal DNA. So there, there's your hybridization. And that happened, that happened at a time where the archaeological evidence shows us that human culture transformed drastically. Yeah. And that only makes sense. So it's... Um, and, and again, this is an example of the two, two different things coming towards each other and kind of combining... And creating something, and to a certain extent, going past each other, mm. but 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 definitely in terms of that human hybridization with the Neanderthals and the, the Cro-Magnon uh, people, kind of one overwhelming the other. Ne by Neanderthal, you mean the water, the people that were original. It's well, that's earlier. That's earlier. The, the, okay, the aquatic... I, I'm like my. Yeah, oh no, this is good to get into. This is good to get into for people. Yeah, Dana and I were discussing the aquatic ape hypothesis, which yeah. is fascinating. Uh, and I think that explains a lot of things, even though a lot of people say it's discredited. I think it explains a lot of wonderful things. The aquatic ape hypothesis is that the idea that uh, humans and chimpanzees split from a common ancestor that we don't know what it is. And uh, some alternative researchers and some anthropologists and archaeologists think that at a time when the Rift Valley in Africa became filled with water that Australopithecus and the ancestor of Austro Australopithecus, which is Lucy, this is way, 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 way before modern humans, um, less than a million years ago, but uh, way longer than 300, way longer than 300,000. So uh, around in there you had uh, our ancestors and what made us distinct from the rest of the great apes is that the split that went into Australopithecus away from the common chimp ancestor that instead of living among the trees it lived in kind of swampy tree lake type areas and so the women would have uh, you know more buoyancy <laughs> and would stay and, and, and would keep and would keep the babies and the families gathering shellfish and uh, enjoying seafood and with the kids by the water and by the way you toss human babies in water and they know how to hold their breaths explain that um, and then you know babies holding on to the mom's hair women have longer hair ape women don't <laughs> so um, and then the men would go up and go run around and be hunting and have more hair than the women because they were staying warm and not getting sunburned. Um, it, it really goes a long way to explain a lot of things. Yeah, it's the aquatic ape hypothesis. The, the hybridization, there probably was some hybridization all along the line, but the hybridization with Neanderthals happened in genetic terms and geological terms quite recently. That would have happened around 35,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, maybe older. I think it's hard. I'm not an expert on this, but definitely older than the last ice age because all the neanderthals were dead by then the end of the last ice age so um, pretty much at the time this hybridization occurred around the time that humans started creating art i don't think that's an accident they started creating art they started creating higher technology in terms of better stone tools our first evidence of religion. It's quite possible, like you said, that religion is older than this, but our first evidence of religious practice 
of, of doing something different about dead people, um, about doing something different about the stars, doing something different about animals, um, and thinking about it differently. Uh, the evidence for that starts at about this time where the, the Neanderthal hybridization happened. That's interesting. That kind of relates to that idea of reciprocal space in a way that, like you said, the, the physical is doing that mutation and that, uh, which is, we're at that point again where some of us are wanting to be in the ocean. Some of us are wanting to be in the sky. Some of us are wanting to be underground. Uh, there's just so many, some of us are wanting to be in space. Evolution is- You are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many different things that are happening right now, but the, with the physical, but the metaphysical and the concept of religion, it does, I feel, go to this sort of idea of agnostic and deciding, like decisive decision of consciousness and unconsciousness. And once those sort of overlap, um, that's kind of that, that place where everything is just, uh, there, there's, there's a constant change. Uh, right now I feel that within the physical, we are, we are just about here, but with our idea of the spiritual, we're way on the opposite sides. So it, there's going to be this, um, that's really interesting. So there's like so, there's some real huge. <laughs> it's pretty obvious looking at the news. There's some real cultural chiropractic that's happening. But you, I think you're describing the gap. The, you're describing the crick in the neck of culture that needs to be straightened out here, in, in a in an interesting way. Um, d talk, talk more about that. So you think that there's that there's a, a real connection in, in the physical. What do you mean by the connection in the physical realm? The connection where we are all at the same time deciding that we want to then cross and split. Okay, I see. Yes. So the connection, the connection would be then, if I'm understanding you correctly, the connection would be then the decisiveness of saying, "I am believing this." Not in, not within the spiritual and the metaphysical, and the esoteric, but within the physical space of evolution of human of human human evolution and the earth's sort of uh bodies like people oh, I see. people and and living beings you know oh i see so you're saying you're saying that the fact just the fact of bodily existence the fact that we're sharing uh we're sharing the same rules of physics the same rules of chemistry is that what you mean the same Yes, this, okay. we're sharing the same chemistry, we're right. sharing the same genes, and the same, mm. in, in a sense, like, we're sharing the same... Um, same patterns. Same patterns, yeah. We, yeah. we all have similar... The, we all have similar bodies, similar, similar bone structures, where our outsides might be different, but our insides are very much the same. Okay, so there's a splitting. There's a splitting that is happening. I think due to uh, a crisis of rejection of old forms. Mm -hmm. So there is a detachment from the culture at large, and then a, sep a further separation into two camps. One being decisively for belief of spiritual nature and decisively against belief of spiritual nature. Yes. Okay. So the yes, so the crisis of lack of adaptive change in the culture at large has created this d detaching and then further the separation. Mm -hmm. And the separation is unsustainable. Um, and because the communities cannot hold both of these two things unless they agree on some kind of common ground um, because right now you're having a lot of people yelling and screaming about things and, and looking for excuses to yell and scream about things uh, because they feel like these problems aren't, they, they have all these problems that aren't being addressed and there are problems that aren't being addressed but that's different from what the yelling and screaming is about, it's my own two cents. Um, 
So, do you think that how how do you think that this and this might be a good thought to end it on? How do you and to look forward with? How do you think that this shakes out the resolution of the bifurcation? I believe that just as we spoke before about how neither one can be without the other, mm. they might be at opposite ends, but it, like you said, is it is unsustainable. And just like nature and just like the pendulum, it is unsustainable as a matter of fact and as a necessity at the same time. So it is a necessity that things and systems um, and old ways tend to break down and that new systems arise at the same time new systems break their new philosophies and they both tend to break down so that they can once again meet in the middle and once again have a sort of unification. That is an excellent point. And by the way, uh, speaking of new systems, uh, there is something that's going to be upcoming. Uh, there's a link in the description, the Puaral Conference, about people thinking about adaptation, thinking about the future, thinking about uh, systems of architecture, systems of design, systems of business for helping the world do the things it needs to help be sustainable, to be better. Um, I will be, uh, I have been informed of uh, my abstract to that being accepted, so uh, we're going to be uh, seeing what happens and listening to uh, some other fascinating ideas on that. So stay tuned. Uh, we look forward to uh, bringing you more about the, uh, the Puaral uh, Conference, uh, which is now digital online in these, in these interesting times. <laughs> yeah. The old Chinese curse. So, Dana, once again, Thank you so much. Well, yeah, I, I always enjoy this. Thank you, and I, I very much enjoy you. And congratulations, David, on uh, on being part of this talk. I think that's really great, and I'm Thank super you. excited to to watch and to uh, participate in in the listening and uh, be within the audience on this online thing. I I heard you say it, it's free for students. Yeah, yeah, you can go to, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there in, in uh, podcast land, uh, the general public pays 50 bucks to see all the stuff online. Students get it for free. So go down there um, and uh, talk to the great people at Puarl to, uh, to see what's going on if you're interested in uh, cutting-edge thought in the world of architecture. So, thank you. And again, please, like, subscribe, complain about us to five friends and encourage them to complain even more. Thank you. <laughs>